meeting. Uh, this is actually one year. Uh, however, instead of doing uh, any sort of partying for November, we'll save it for next month. And next month we'll be uh, taking a break from the sessions and watch a little Silicon Valley. Best show ever. Yeah. Uh, we'll watch uh, episode one and two of season one. So come and hang out next month. It'll be awesome. Okay, this month, intro member, Neil Hooper. Hi, Neil. <laughs> Not a whole lot going on, man. Uh, let's just scrub everyone's info for what happening this month, and not a lot. So, uh, Drupal's meeting, we're moving. M moving the date this month? Or? Yeah, I haven't had a chance to change it yet. Okay, what, what's the date? It's gonna be the 19th. 19th, awesome. Still meeting where? I don't know yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's talking to you. Post it up. <laughs> okay. what, what is Drupal? This is my first meeting. Ah, Drupal. You, you want to talk about Drupal for a second? Uh, Drupal's content management <coughs> framework is very similar to, well, not really similar to WordPress, but do you know, the same genre. You're familiar with these one of those. And you guys, so you guys are on meetup.com too, so if you are not on meetup.com, be sure to go sign up. You get the notifications about all the date changes and all that good stuff. Uh, Springfield Creatives. Show of hands, Any, anybody in creatives? Not a whole lot in here. It is a pretty awesome group, guys. Uh, it is, you know, not so much focus on code stuff. Uh, as you can see, uh, this one's the Queen City Craft Show. It'll be cool, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, Python developers uh, doing an intro to Git, uh, I believe, in that room over yonder on the 27th. So check that out. .NET users group, uh, don't have any details on, on what's going on there this month. Uh, Midwest I.O. in Kansas City. Seems like a pretty awesome conference. Uh, I think it's the second year, so uh, I'm curious <coughs> if you check that out. The big news though is Startup Weekend. Anyone here helping out organize that? No, Charlie. No, Charlie's not here. Um, okay, so I wasn't there last year, but this is the second year of this, so I don't have a lot of details, but the gist of it is a bunch of people show up and you kind of form uh, teams and execute on ideas. Uh, I think there's some maybe investors there, uh, but it's, you know, pitch an idea, build the project, uh, present it at the end, and I think they pick kind of uh, three winners. And I, uh, URL there, sorry, I don't, there's not a lot of info there either, so. Uh, so, I said, watch party next month. And then I think in January we'll be doing a Flexbox session. Um, so if you're still laying out with floats and absolutely hate it, you'll want to come to that session. Um, I have one more bit, I think, before we turn it over. A um, bunch of students at OTC are looking for internships. So if uh, you work anywhere uh, that might be looking for interns, let me know. I've got some contact info to give you. Um, I've got some qualified students looking for some work, so let me know. Turn it over to Neil Hooper now, and for JS. Hooper. Hey. Can everybody hear me just fine? Do I have to use the microphone? <coughs> no? All right, cool. All right, who here has made a single page JavaScript application? Okay, keep your hands up. Were you okay? If I name something you were using, keep your hands up. And if you haven't used it, go ahead and lower your hands. Okay, so Backbone, React, Angular, Ember. What do you use? I also use Meteor. Oh, okay. Cool. Meteor is the shit. I haven't checked it out. Meteor is the shit. <laughs> yeah. Meteor well, the shit or the shit? The shit. All right. Very big difference. <laughs> All right, so nobody here has used Ember, but they kind of generally get the idea of what a single page JavaScript application is all about. Does anybody here not get what that is or understand what that means? Okay. I'll be brave, soul. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so whenever you have a single page JavaScript application, all of your application code, or most of it, gets loaded into the browser. And basically any call that gets made after that is to, you know, an API to get JSON or message pack or what have you, and then I don't know, it's like a lot faster because you don't have to make a full trip back to the server to get the new representation of what you just asked for. Okay, so, 
talk about the origin of Ember real fast. I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, has anybody here heard of Sprout Core? Uh, Ember 2, or like Ember, was originally going to be Sprout Core 2. And uh, what the deal is with Sprout Core is that it's heavily based off of Coco. And uh, so, and that's even its view layer. So it had a pretty cumbersome view layer if you wanted to customize the way that it looked. If you had a web developer that was pretty skilled in front end work, they wouldn't be able to transfer that skill set <coughs> to making the user interface look the way that they wanted to. So the idea behind Sprout Core 2 was to make it to where you could use HTML templates and still maintain the auto-updating aspect of that. <coughs> anyway, Sprout Core is pretty neat. I have never built anything with it, but I've been following it a little bit. I don't really know, I haven't looked at it in a while, but anyway, it's pretty neat. So what's Ember? We've already kind of gone over a little bit of this. It's a single page application framework. It's kind of a battery, well, I'm saying batteries included because it has pretty much everything that you need. It, I don't know if you guys have ever used Backbone and found out that it doesn't really give you a whole lot. So that's why there's things like Marionette and things like that that lend more of an idea of how to structure your application. All of that is sort of prescribed for you with the way that Ember is set up. Yeah, you need to probably <laughs> read what I'm gonna have up there for. Why use it? Auto updating templates. This is really nice because whenever you change your model, it's going to automatically reflect uh, that inside the view layer of your application. I don't know if you guys ever used RDO, but that is built in Backbone. And sometimes you'll see things like adding a playlist and then the number of playlists does not increment along with you having a new uh, playlist. And that's because there's nothing like monitoring that and it doesn't automatically update itself. Easy persistence, this is, it's actually pretty nice, the, uh, the data layer that it has. <coughs> Even if you have like a really janky API, there's a way that you can serialize it and kind of like munge it into where it's something that Ember expects it to be. And it's surprisingly easy to do and pretty clean, I think. Yeah, and after the initial learning curve, and there is quite a bit of a learning curve for it, but once you get past that, you can be pretty productive. And one other thing that comes along with that is, uh, if you have an Ember developer that you hired that's already experienced, they can jump right into your code and kind of just get going right with it, almost like it's a Rails application or something like that. <coughs> There's Ember CLI, which is pretty much the the thing that they are, it's pretty well telling you it's mandated to use this. It's an asset pipeline. Uh, it also, you know, builds and minifies and concatenates everything like that, like an asset like pipeline does. It does the generation of code and a whole lot of the nice things for you. And it allows for things like add-ons. There's an entire big bunch of those things. So almost anything you can think of is going to be there. Like I, I needed to add analytics to mine, so I just like type in the analytics here, I can just add that into my application, mix something into the router, and then it's automatically keeping track of everything and sending stuff back to Google, and you almost have to do nothing to get that set up. It's really nice. Oh yeah, so routes. I keep talking about Backbone, but it's because it's the only other uh, framework that I've actually built something in. And out of the box, it kind of breaks the back button. If you are you know, in a certain state in your application, you hit the back button, it's going to mess everything up. You can't, I mean, you can't just like, you know, navigate through the different states of your application using the forward and back button. Ember has always had a router and everything is pretty well based around routes. So if you say like foo forward slash one, it's going to, okay, so you define a route called foo, and then you would say that it accepts a parameter called like uh, ID or something like that. And whenever you go into that route, it'll hand into the model hook, which I'll get into, the ID, and then you can pull information from wherever, and then it'll add, it'll hand that information off to the controller. And then also any events that 
bubble up from your fuel air that are not handled by the controller will go to the route. You have models, which of course define the properties and behavior, didn't spell that right, of the data presented to the user. There's not a whole lot more to it, really. Controllers decorate models. And uh, what that basically means is that if you just have a model that has just first name and last name, you can define a property on your controller that concatenates the two of them, and it and it'll also watch them too. So you'll define a property on the controller that watches both of those. So if it changes, it'll automatically change the whole name thing for you. It's pretty nice. And yeah, it can handle events fired from the view layer. And if your controller doesn't do it, it'll go to the route and then any parent route that it has. And if it's not handled, it actually throws an exception. You don't want it to be firing actions that are not handled. Oh yeah, and controllers are singletons and they can have state that exists as long as the app is running. They're about ready to get away from this and they want you to use something called services, but I don't want to get too far into the weeds about that because I'm just going to show you a really small subset of Ember tonight. <coughs> we have templates. The templates are written in a, something called HTML bars. It used to be called handlebars, but Handlebars emitted strings, and HTML bars actually build DOM nodes. <coughs> and it's really, really fast, thanks to the new rendering engine called Glimmer, where they basically stole all the ideas from React. So React did a DOM dipping thing every time something changed, and it would just find out what it needs to update in the actual live DOM, and then it just applies those changes. Ember now does that too, and because the templates are declarative, unlike JSX, and it can actually have more information about what it's supposed to update. So it can be faster than React at this point. And then you have components, which are, I'm not gonna touch on views tonight because they are, uh, they're deprecated in Ember. I still use them because I've got a pretty large application <laughs> that I wrote that uh, I haven't migrated away from that. They're reusable user interface bits and uh, what else we got here? They're composable. And the thing about them is the way that they're designed makes it, it really makes it to where a programmer, it makes it difficult for a programmer to make it towards tight and bound to anything that it's displaying. And the implementation of the controller or whatever like that is not going to affect its ability to be used somewhere else. I hope that makes sense. That's my last slide, so I'm going to jump into some code here. Oh, by the way, this is my first time ever giving a talk, and I'm not using my own box right now, so this kind of sucks. <laughs> Could you maybe like command plus a little bit and make that bigger? Oh yeah, that works on supply. Well, don't go crazy. Right? <laughs> Mike, is this your mess? It is. Why am I not sitting down older? Back up one directory, I think you have to give the actual full name. No, hit the terminal. Why right to the left? Why oh, yeah, hit the download? That's not in there. <laughs> okay. Sort by date. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. I see it now. I was assuming it was alphabetical or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Dude, why would you do that? Here's the actual code. Uh, we're going to start out by talking about the router. And this will kind of lead into a few other things. You have your router, and you'll notice that I don't have anything defined inside here at all. That's because I'm not, I'm basically just using the index route. Without having to define any routes, you get two routes off the bat. You get the application route and the index route. And then Ember uses a, a dependency injection thing that it has built into itself. And what'll happen is if you don't have an application route defined, it will generate one for you and it just uses the basic implementation. Same thing with index. I don't really need to do a whole lot with the application route, so I didn't define one, but I did define an index route. 
and that's where I'm basically handing off an Ember array. And the Ember array has all kinds of nice things like uh, you know filter by, sort by, things like that. Uh, and also you can you know observe changes to it. So instead of using push on this, you would say push object or push objects, and that's how all of these uh, key value coding and all that sort of things, you know, know whenever something's changed and knows whenever to update stuff. And then that gets handed off to the controller. See, that's the model hook, sorry. This is the model hook. This gets called every time you go into a route. And then that's what gets returned to your index controller. So I just kind of implicitly have a model attribute or a property on this controller. You can define other things, like that'll be used inside your template. This is a computed property. Well, it actually gets handed into the uh, computed property here. It tells it how to sort the model. And we're doing it by creating that descending. So these are computed properties here. Whether or not the title exists is based on, you know, the property of the, the controller itself. So this is an example of a computed property here. And it has kind of a weird a weird semantics to it because you're calling, you know, property on a function itself. You get the title, figure out if it's truly and if its length is greater than zero, and then so it returns a Boolean whether or not you have anything typed into that field. Add to do, push object, and then set the title. <coughs> If anybody has any questions about what I'm doing right now, please let me know. I've got a question. So I assume that that property call is, is also registering some kind of a watcher. So if you have multiple properties that you're you're combining, you, do they both go in that property call or just one? Oh yeah, yeah, that's exactly what would happen. So like if you had like a whole name, you would say function. Time those two properties would update, then you would uh, then this would automatically update, and you want to specifically state if it's on the model that it's coming off the model. This is almost like arguments for the function. Just uh, to put them within the function brackets or something. No, you wouldn't do that. It's it's it's. I haven't even looked at how it's implemented, but it's going to be something on function prototype where they add this into it. So if whenever you would initiate the object is probably going to scan all of its properties and find out which ones have, you know, have this. I, I don't even know how it happens, but there's a lot of, there's some magical stuff that happens in there. But basically, you just call <laughs> that property on a function, and that's how it knows that it's a property that has things that it's dependent upon. And then this is an action. I'm choosing to handle the action inside the controller rather than the, than the router. So you usually start with a route, then you define what, what data is going to be pulled in by the route, and then you go to the controller and set up this sort of thing, and then you make a template for that. <coughs> Alright, so this is our application template. It's just called to-dos, and you'll notice this thing called outlet. What's happening there is that any child route is going to have its template inserted into that outlet. So this is index. So the context of, or the contents of this is going to be inserted into the application, uh, applet, application template outlet. So here is an input helper. I think this is actually a component at this point. Its value is title. So the context of this right now is the controller. So I don't have to explicitly say controller.title. Its action is add to do and then Whenever I hit enter, it's going to call add. Well, actually, I don't even have to have that. There we go. So whenever I hit enter, it's going to call the add to do. It's going to fire off that action, and then the controller is going to catch it, and then add it to the array. And this is where the, the controller that title exists thing pops up. I don't even have to have that there. Basically, gives you this right here. So, like, meow. So that 
added it to the template. And if it's completed, then it doesn't show it. You can see that in the template. Unless to do is complete, then go ahead and show it. So the checked property of this input helper or component is the to do dot is complete. And it's iterating over the sorted model that I uh, had declared inside the controller. I've got a question on that. Sure. How specific is that? Is it on mouse down, mouse up, or attribute equals checked? It's going to be, okay, so right now the checked property of that to do or that, that control mm -hmm. is bound to a Boolean mm -hmm. and called is complete. Okay. So if you change that, then it changes the underlying model. So it's the checked attribute on the box that's actually firing that off? Yes. Cool. Yeah, so it would be like an on change or on, what is that, like on value change? Or There's on an on update. On update, there you go, that's what it would be, roughly. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really all there is to making a <coughs> new application. But I have another question back on that last screen. Sure. Uh, that syntax using unless. Yeah. Could you have done if exclamation point? Or no, you cannot do any sort of negation or anything like that. Huh. So then that's what makes these templates declarative. <coughs> you can't have any logic inside of them at all. Uh, <coughs> you can make helpers, like it for date formatting and stuff like filters, that. Filters, right. Yeah, yeah, it's like a filter like from Django or something text, like that. Text filter, yeah. yeah. So you couldn't say, for example, you know, to do's completed to do's and then have unless to do dot is not complete? Okay, say that one more time. So he was asking about like the negation, like yeah. if exclamation mark. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't have like to do's and completed to do's and then just have another set of braces there for unless to do dot is not complete? Well, it's just if is complete, wouldn't it be? Yeah, that's what it would be. Then you would be having a different list of the So unless is the opposite of yeah. if okay. being the true statement. Yeah. Okay. So so you could copy that code and change that to an if and we would see, we would see once you check only, it, it would pop down to what has been completed, yes. Well, but never see anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, we would now because he's got two. Or is that duplicated? Are they then so make they the second one somewhere? Yeah. They store in the browser. Oh, you're right. Session. You would never see it because, yeah, it's, it's yeah. just going to be transient. Yeah. Copy-paste it and change one to if and one to unless. Yeah. It would throw a, it would not compile it. And that's the other thing about it is that HTML bars is a full-blown HTML compiler. I mean, like, it will, it, you know, parses it and then emits like DOM nodes and stuff like that. And if you have one of these uh, each statements right here, it'll make a DOM fragment out of that and then reuse that the entire time. It's pretty cool how that works and it's very fast. Now you're saying you can't you can't duplicate that and change the unless you know. I could, but what would happen is you wouldn't see anything because the, the, the to do's right now are transient. If I refresh the page, then as soon as I enter it, it's not gonna show anything ever. You could duplicate that block. Oh, yeah, yeah. duplicate it. Ah, okay, yeah, let's do that. We'll make a whole new UL or whatever. Yeah, you probably want to get the UL too. Sorry, I wasn't very clear in how I was asking that. That's yeah. fine. I think the audience was. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but he's trying to present something. I know. This yeah, is, he's not like <laughs> trying to write something. Yeah. Right now. No, the question should be ready. Yeah, so once you make the change, is it like live? You just refresh the page and you get the code? It does it for you. So the MRCLI pipeline takes also has a live reload thing built into it. And it doesn't, it's not smart enough to catch things like uh, if you just like modified a less file or something like that, it's going to reload the whole thing. I've seen some nicer things where you can, you know, kind of intelligently do like a cache buster on your, you know, minified styles and then, it, you know, the browser will automatically reload the new styles, but it doesn't do that right now. There's nothing like browser five for it, either, <coughs> which kind of stinks. Here we go. Does it play nice with stuff like Coda, where the um, IDE would also do that with live refreshing, <coughs> or would it get angry at you? It would probably get pretty angry. Okay. So there you go. Yeah. Sorry, I was 
Okay. So, did you have to actually start up the pipeline before you started the demo? Uh, yes, I did. So that is. Yeah, there we go. So I, I typed in Ember serve, and then it fires this up, and I've already got things that are deprecated. That's another thing about Ember is that they are pretty <coughs> aggressive about deprecating their public APIs but they do that in a way that's not too bad because if they deprecate something for the entirety of whatever major version number you have, it's fine. And even if you're using a private API, you get like 12 weeks to fix that. They tell you exactly, like even if you're using a private API, it'll scream at you and just be like, hey, you're using a deprecated API, it's private and it's gonna be gone in two point releases. And they do a, a new point release every six weeks and they, it's kind of interesting how they develop it because they have everything in the same code base and they just hide things that they don't think are ready for prime time behind feature flags. And that's something you can use for your production applications too. Like if you have a feature that you haven't like put out in the wild yet and you do put it out in the wild and it's messed up or something like that, you can just put it back behind the feature flag and pop your thing back out there. Who is they? Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the two main guys behind this are Tom Dale and Yehuda Katz. And Yehuda Katz is one of the core contributors to jQuery. He's pretty much the guy that was um, uh, responsible for Rails 3. He was the guy who was making Merb. And there was this, I remember whenever Rails 3 was being announced, it was just like, Rails 3 is Merb 2, because he pretty much overhauled it. He's also on the Sprout for, for uh, team and uh, he's a member of TC39, which are the, those are the people who are kind of getting together to decide what's going to happen with the future of JavaScript. All right. Does anybody have any questions? What kind of community is there out there for Ember development? So if I decide I want to make a production app like this and I'm an idiot and like to Google everything because I don't want to figure it out. Is there good support of documentation? No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, here we go. Let's oh, discuss with EmberJS.com. Okay, so discuss is something that's written by I think it's Jeff Atwood. Yep. And uh, he uh, this is written in Ember, and it's kind of his vision for what the future of the forum is like. And there's a lot of discussion that happens here, and uh, well, I mean, people have questions. And I've never really used it, for, like I usually go on the Freenode channel for Ember, and you can get help pretty quickly there, a lot of the time. And then uh, if you can't figure it out, reading the source code will really kind of help you out if you don't know exactly what's going on. I've only had to resort to that just a few times, and there's way too much for me to even have a red light. 20% of it. And then there's, uh, let's see here, Ember Igniter. This is a really great resource right here. And it's, it's kept very up to date. One of the things that you will get kind of frustrated with, with Ember is that uh, you'll find, if you're Googling for it, you'll find very old information for it on uh, Stack Overflow and things like that, and it's just kind of a non-starter almost, because Ember CLI didn't exist for like a while, and I've got a, uh, an app that I've had in production for over two years, and I didn't start with Ember CLI. I was using something called Brunch to do, you know, to build everything, and then the move to Ember CLI was kind of a bear, but I'm glad I did it. But if you if you're searching around for you know information on Ember, and they're not talking about Ember CLI, it's too old to even be worth anything. I set up something so you guys can mess around with it if you want to. This is not live because I typed in the wrong thing. <laughs> okay, so what I did here is I kind of spiced up, spiced it up a little bit. This is a to do's application that has had the adapter switched out for something called Ember Pouch, which is pretty cool. It uses PouchDB, 
which is an impl the JavaScript implementation of CouchDB. And what's kind of neat about it is that you have an offline ready application that's kind of out of the gate. And then you can tell it to, uh, I don't know if anybody here has used CouchDB and something called Photon that's built into it. <coughs> well, anyway, it's a full blown implementation of uh, CouchDB and there's something called Futon or Photon. There's actually two different things that are admin panels for it. So you can get a Chrome plugin that you can use to administrate the local copy of your, your couch database and then tell it like the URL of another couch database and it can sync whatever you want. But I told this one right here to go to something that I set up earlier, get to sync couch. We did that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I can do this right here, and it should go away. <laughs> so what you're saying is you could work offline, and then once you would come online again, it, it would sync up to a remote yeah. database. Uh -huh. So and this is really easy to do, because there's all these different adapters that are out there for, uh, for Ember data. There's one for Rails, and if you use the Rails API, then you almost have your back end for free, because you can get the active model adapter and it just talks to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's nice try. <laughs> do, you know, do you know how chatty the sync is? It's very, very chatty. Let's look in the, let's look in here. It is so But it's, it's intelligent enough not to try when you're online. Yes, and it can tell whenever you're back online. So let's see how chatty this thing is. <coughs> So it's going to look at the container for an adapter for every one of your models, but if it can't find one for it, it's going to try to look for an application one. So every model that you define from this point forward is going to use this application adapter, and it's going to just make it to where it works. And then you can see where I set up the pouch database and all this sort of thing like here, and make it to where, the main reason why all this stuff, all this junk right here is there, is so it automatically syncs with everything so you can get that kind of know, nice effect where it just kind of pops up everywhere on whoever's looking at it. All right, I think that's about it. Uh, does anybody have any questions? What's up? Can you use alternate templating languages? Can you use alternate templating languages? Yes, there's one called Emblem. This is like Hamel. I don't know if you guys have ever used Hamel. So what, what happens here is that uh, people were worried that whenever HTML bars came out that you know, like Emblem wouldn't work with it, but both Hamel bars, HTML bars, and all that sort of stuff, uh, they just compile down to the same AST that gets handed off to whatever turns it into either a string or 
a bunch of Dom stuff. So this is the only other alternative that I'm aware of. And I just wind up using HTML bars. It doesn't bother me at all. If you're going to, you showed all those add-ons using the CLI, but if, if let's say you have like a little, you know, widget built already and you want to include it in a, an Ember app, is it, it looked like there was like includes at the top of files. Is it really easy to include third-party JavaScript without it conflicting? Well, you know, I, you would kind of want to have your third-party JavaScript have its own element and not interact much with Ember outside of that. And you can do that. Yeah, like I've got an application that uses Google Maps, and it's it's you know, it works really nice. But I'm not doing anything with the inside of it. Uh, I'm not messing with its view layer or anything like that. I can add markers and things like that. There's a, there's like a, Ember View has. Uh, <coughs> hooks like did insert elements will destroy element and things like that where you can set up hooks into things that are third party and then whenever it's about ready to get rid of the uh, view that you have it's going to call will destroy element so you can tear down any sort of event listeners or anything like that that you have and then of course it, it's going to set it's going to fire did insert element after it did put it in so it has it has things like that to work with third party things but talking about like a calendar or something like that yeah I mean that, that's yeah I mean at my, at my company we have we have one customer that's like 15 projects and we have like common UX elements across all that's the where, that's where components come in that's where you would probably want to build a library of components and there's things like Ember page well but so the the tech stack across all the applications is varying so not all of them are single page apps some of them are straight in VC so well then yeah <coughs> some of them are on different you know tech stacks you're going to want to, I mean, you, you can have an Ember app that like doesn't go, doesn't take over the entire HTML element. You can tell it what element to attach itself into and have like Ember exist inside of another thing. But if you're doing that for like multiple instances of something on a page, then it's probably going to be a little bit much. But Ember papers are cool. Ember could listen for like JSON payloads coming from all the various sources, right? I think that there is a Ajax prefix filter that you can use to hook into something like that, or Ajax pre-filter. So kind of an event model, at least, that you can marshal back and forth. Well, I, I wouldn't know a whole lot about it. I don't know how you would do it without polling or something like that. But if you add a, an Ajax pre-filter, any time it's going to make an Ajax request, you can probably like hook into that. But I don't, I don't use Ember in a way that's like that where it has to integrate with anything else, like, except for Google Maps. And Google Maps has its own element, and I don't really do a whole lot with it. How, how big is like a vanilla payload? Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty heavy. That's what she said. <laughs> so it looks like it's NG Inspector. It's going to be very, very this bottom. what? Very, very bottom. Very, very bottom. Six hundred fifty-six k. See now, uh, let's see if that is actually like minified. It is not minified. So if you minify it, it actually gets quite a bit smaller. Uh, I think the last time I tried to clock that, it was coming in at about 150 kilobytes. So it's it's heavier than a lot of things are, but you get a lot along with it. What was the total? Uh, this right here, it's like 656 kilobytes, but it's not minified okay. or gzipped. Okay. So after it's minified and gzipped, it's actually not that bad. Mine was like a meg with the base library. Really? And it's 200k minified. Oh my gosh. Why? <laughs> Got a lot of stuff. Yeah. All right. For, just with the for all their yeah. angles. Mm -hmm. probably have to look at it. And it's probably a lot smaller than this now because uh, this is Ember 1.13.
and then Ember 2 just came out, and all of the stuff, all the APIs that they deprecated along with uh, like throughout the lifetime of Ember 1.x were just completely stripped out. Anything that's deprecated is gone now, so it eliminated a lot of code. And then, I don't know, it's kind of nice because it took them about two years to go from one to two, like version one to version two, and anything that you write on any version of Ember 1.x is gonna work with any new version of Ember 1.x. And, okay, the nice thing about 1.13 is that if you have no deprecation warnings at all, then it's ready for Ember 2. There's no new features with Ember 2. It's just stripping out everything that's deprecated from Ember 1.x. Anything else? Does it utilize some third-party library or engine? It has browser. a hard dependency on jQuery. Okay, so in terms of the, I guess, right, does it come with any like UX elements or anything? Or is it just no, no, that's what they were trying to get away from, really. That's what Sprout 4 was like. It came with a bunch of widgets and things like that, and they they wanted to get away from that sort of thing. And that's you know why they diverged away from it. Hello? Okay. Where would you go to get this? Well, uh, what you need to have is a, well, you got to be fairly comfortable inside of the terminal, I'd say. And uh, let me close this up. Okay. Uh, Whoops. installed is npm and then you would say as you do npm install ember cli and if you're using a windows box i don't know what to tell you <laughs> <laughs> i would say run a linux virtual machine which i've, I've actually done at places that make me use a windows box at work i think you can i think you can run it on yeah, yeah, just, right. just take off the suit. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if that's bad form to to do that. Like I've heard that globally install NPM. I've heard that the the file the regeneration of all the files that happen actually slows makes it working on the Windows box almost impossible. Oh yeah. They like said even the Macs Git runs really slow on Windows. I don't really know what that's They said Macs about. were the only thing that they could get to work consistent with it. It's a relatively large application. And they generate the pipeline, because they have to generate the pipeline and, and commit that. Mm -hmm. They can't. They, they can't have the pipeline running in direction. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they said with all the file changes, Windows boxes are really slow. And they said Linux is the same, is is better, but not amazing. And they said Macs are the only thing that can do it. Okay, so okay. back to what you were talking about, like a widget library, or <coughs> you were talking about a widget library, or something like that. That was. Okay. We showed the CLI at Snap it. Okay, so this is a set of, uh, of components that are pre-built that you can use with Ember. So it comes with all the styles and everything like that. So there are there are UI toolkits out there that have been built. This is built off of Google's material design, like it's based off of that idea. And it's it's pretty slick, really. So you, is that showing that you actually can instantiate the element in the, oh. in the bars? Yeah, yeah. So this is how you, this is how components work right here. So that that would be what you would have if you had Ember Paper installed. What you would install through Ember. It's an Ember add-on. So if you had Ember CLI, you could just say like Ember add-on add at Ember Paper, and then it just zaps all this stuff down, and you can start using it like that. It's really pretty cool. So this would be great for like some sort of back-end, you know, non-public facing thing. It has all of your form elements and stuff like that built in there for you. See if you've got fancy switches and stuff. So yeah, it, there are pre-built widget libraries for it. And it's also 
pretty nice and uh, responsive here. So if you have a mobile application, that'll pop out to the side and you can just kind of get through. And I'm pretty sure there's got to be like like 30 different implementations of Bootstrap for it. This is one of two Google Material Design UI things that I'm aware of, and I think this one's a little bit better. Never paper. Anything else? All right. I'm gonna call it a wrap then. Ooh.